Okay, uh, good afternoon. On Thursday I returned from leading a trade mission of 22 businesses to Mexico, uh, Colombia, Chile and Brazil and I had successful meetings with the presidents of those four countries. As you know, uh, three of the four leaders I had met before and establishing uh, personal relationships with the president of Mexico, Colombia and Brazil helps uh, to place New Zealand firmly in the world view. All three leaders welcomed closer engagement with New Zealand and were positive about forging closer ties in areas like trade, services, investment and agriculture. Um, Mexico, Colombia and Chile all confirmed their support for New Zealand's bid uh, for a seat on the UN Security Council, which is a huge bid. Uh, President Giuseppe of Brazil was forward leading about Brazil's consideration of support for New Zealand, a real plus considering Brazil really gives away its voting preferences, so that was one of the highlights of the trip. President Santos said Colombia was ready to negotiate an FTA with New Zealand, which is an agreement I'd like to see addressed quickly, and one that we're starting to work on. Negotiating an FTA with Colombia is useful in its own right. For example, exports of New Zealand milk powder to Colombia face a 90% tariff, uh, compared to a 33% tariff uh, for US milk uh, uh, due to the US um, Colombia FTA. However, negotiating the FTA with Colombia also has a broader significance. It would mean New Zealand would have a pathway to free trade with each of the four countries which make up the Pacific Alliance, uh, namely Mexico, Colombia, Peru and Chile. I also met President uh, Pinera of Chile in Santiago. We had a good discussion about the TPP negotiations. In Chile and Brazil, we signed uh, agreements to boost the number of students to be educated in New Zealand from secondary schools through to PhD students. In Chile, the economy uh, minister announced an extension of the Penguins Without Borders scheme, which could bring up to $7.5 million per annum in export earnings for New Zealand secondary schools. And in Brasilia, uh, President Giuseppe and I witnessed the signing of an agreement uh, which will see New Zealand participate in Brazil's Science Without Borders program, which should see the increase in the number of Brazilian students who study in New Zealand. Uh, the 22 companies travelling with me found the visit to be extremely useful, uh, with new businesses being new business being written and new relationships being formed. By way of example, Education New Zealand finalised a two and a half million dollar contract for Colombian PhD students to study in New Zealand. Air New Zealand gas turbines received a purchase order for engine overhauls in Colombia. From agritech to education to specialised technology, the New Zealand businesses came away with a strong interest in their products and services. A survey done near the end of the visit showed that 22 companies who had over 130 individual meetings and garnered 49 leads, uh, which held a strong uh, potential for concluding new business. There was real excitement about the opportunities the Latin American countries held for New Zealand businesses. Growing middle class and spending power in these countries are translating into demand for hiring specialised services and products, which our businesses are well placed to tap into. New Zealand's branding in Latin America is strong. Uh, it was noteworthy that each country my counterparts remarked positively on New Zealand's strong commitment to the values of democracy, human rights and the rule of law. There was also strong interest, particularly in Chile, about our approach to public policy issues and how the Crown and EU relationships function. Earlier today, Health Minister Tony Ryle announced work will commence on the first stage of the redevelopment of Christchurch's hospital in the next few months. Cabinet has agreed to set aside $500 million for this project, making it the largest and most complex building project in the history of New Zealand's public health service. The total cost of the project is expected to be more than $600 million. Work is expected to commence in June this year, uh, with site work clearance uh, for new facilities at Burwood Hospital. Construction for both hospitals is being fast-tracked. Uh, for Burwood, construction contracts will be awarded by Christmas, uh, with work to begin early next year and completion in 2015. Christchurch Hospital is due to be completed in 2018. The redeveloped Burwood and Christchurch Hospitals will together have 938 beds, an increase of 159 and eight extra new operating theatres. This is another exciting step forward in the rebuilding recovery of the Greater Christchurch region following the earthquakes, which is one of the national government's four main priorities for the term. It's also a good example of the future investment fund, which is the proceeds of the next ownership model uh, being applied to an important asset in Christchurch. Uh, on Friday, I'll be hosting Thais, the Thailand uh, Prime Minister Yingluck Shinawatra at the start of her three day visit on Friday. This is the first visit uh, that Prime Minister Yingluck has made to New Zealand uh, since taking office in 2011. <coughs> Thailand and New Zealand share close ties. We have a strong trading relationship with good trade 
uh, doubling since the closer economic partnership between our two countries was born in 2005. I'm looking forward to discussing with Prime Minister Yingla like how we can leverage opportunities to build off this solid foundation, as well as talking about other issues of mutual interest. In terms of the House this week, uh, the Government intends to continue the appropriation bill and progress the minimum wage starting out amendment bill, student loan amendment bill and the local electorate amendment bill number two and the marine legislation bill. Um, in terms of ministerial activity, uh, I'll be in Wellington uh, obviously today, tomorrow and Wednesday. I'm, uh, on Thursday I'm off to Taranaki, opening the new Peter plant for Todd Energy. And on Friday, as I mentioned, I'll be in Auckland uh, for myself and some retired runners. Questions? What happened with the car park tax? Did, did National essentially say that Peter Dunn didn't want this tax? No, the Minister came to Cabinet today to give us an, uh, an update. Of the situation. What happened was that he had sought uh, both uh, further advice from his own officials about the likely compliance costs and had taken some soundings, I think, from uh, the submissions that had gone to the select committee. What's fair to say is that the conclusion that he reached and Cabinet agreed with was that um, while there's likely to be some revenue for the Crown and while it's quite clear that there's um, unfairness in the way the law currently is applied, that the compliance costs, while not nearly probably as significant as the estimations that the select committee had, would still put some burden on the private sector and on balance it probably wasn't worth progressing. It's it's still still the the advice coming in advice advice during the select committee process, I mean, uh, Labor says you're essentially you're coming out to drive. No, that's not true. Um, what happened was the policy was, as part of the IRD's looking, uh, or IRD's approach of both base broadening and looking at equity within the system. Actually, there's lots of examples of where we do that. Um, that followed the normal standard track, which was there was a discussion document that was put out. I might add that virtually nobody uh, actually raised any of the concerns through the submission process, and ultimately so it went to the select committee. We were obviously aware that there would be some impact, and we were interested in the submissions that, that came about as a result of that. But look, in the end, um, you know, we. We were always going to test the boundaries sometimes on some issues. Um, there was very little pushback during the discussion process, but more we'll pushback in the select committee, and probably on balance it wasn't worth the revenue we'd get. So, what's the advice on the compliance costs compared to that $30 million estimate? From About a tenth was the initial advice, so, uh, so not $30 million, maybe $3 million, but what the official said was that it's very subjective. So, look, it, it could be a bit more, it's hard for them to absolutely know. But if you took the view and said, look, it's not 30 million, maybe it's not 3 million, maybe it's 6 or 7, it's all very subjective. In the end, you said, well, you raise 17, if you put $7 million or some other number like that, cost on the private sector, net on net, probably wasn't worth it. Are we going to have this debate over again with smartphones and laptops? It sounds like we are. Uh, again, they're going through a process of, of consultation, but what I would say is that we, no decision's been made about whether that's going to progress. They're simply just having that, um, that debate, I guess, with the sector at the moment. Businesses argue, though, that these little taxes coming on here and there are disruptive. I mean, they, 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 don't, they just want a simple system. Well, we have an incredibly simple system, and that's the point, isn't it? I mean, we have broad-based, low rate. And, in fact, what we've been doing is simplifying the tax system since we've been in office. That was really the purpose of dropping the top person rate and other rates and aligning them with the trust rate and the likes. I mean, this is a government, if you look at the base broadening issues, firstly, IRD's job is to look at fairness. And actually, there's quite a strong argument that if you pay FPT for an off-premises car park and you don't pay one for an on-premises car park, there's a degree of unfairness about that. The second thing is that we make lots of changes over time. So we've made them to thin capitalisation rules and all sorts of other tax rules around depreciation. Um, so, so sometimes we look at things and, and on balance decide it's not worth it. We effectively did that when we gave up the revenue for the gift duty, for instance, where we were given some revenue, but on balance decided it wasn't worth it for compliance costs. So this was one of those ones which was a bit more at the edge, and when the discussion document went out, we expected a bit more pushback. It never came, and so I think the view was, well, maybe it's less, it's less significant than people thought. But you know, the government is, lives in an, an environment where there is no real extra cash. And we, we have, over the course of the last four years, spent a lot of new money in certain places and had to raise it in others. And we're constantly changing that mix. Now that's the world that we inherited where there's not a lot of cash around. So we always have to test the boundaries. And, and looking at the FPT um, 
application of for on-premise car parks was just one of, quite frankly, hundreds of changes that we look at over the course of time. Were there any political considerations in this decision? For example, your uh, report promised back in 2005 that uh, the government, that your government would do this? No, I mean, but look, at the end of the day, what I actually highlighted in that speech was the very point that sort of came to light, which is my concern wasn't that we're opposed to FPT, actually, largely in favour of FPT. What I was worried about was unnecessary compliance costs. Now, you know, when you, uh, that was made three elections and nearly nine years ago, and I'm prepared to accept that in opposition, sometimes you don't have all of the information that you have in government, and so the officials had over, over a period of time put up a case that said actually it wouldn't, compliance wouldn't be that great or at least there would be you know, some merit in, in fairness of the argument. Over time, things do evolve. But you know, my view on balance was that the Minister made the right recommendation for the revenue versus the compliance cost of wasn't worth very significant. What do you make of David Shearer um, forgetting that he had a bank account in the United Nations for the amount of money? Look, I don't, just don't have any details on that. It's a matter for him, and that's why we have a pecuniary interest list. What did you think of the um, Auckland Council's draft unitary plan do you think it will do the job of building all these houses that all come in? Um, I'm not convinced that it will solve all of the issues. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of debate about actually how much available <coughs> land is really there. Um, I think the unitary plan will certainly help. And the government's supportive of moving that process through faster. Um, the one difference is, of course, the council wants us to approve the plan and fast track it for implementation in September. And our view is that, that there should be at least some capacity for the community to have a, you know, some input about aspects of that plan. There's also a few technical issues about exactly whether, even if we were to fast track it, whether what that would mean under um, notified RMA consent. So look, in the end, uh, we're moving towards the best compromise I think we can, which is at least some, some capacity for input to the community, but a much, much speedier implementation of that plan. Do you share the Reserve Bank Governor's concerns that we face a housing bubble? Well, we've seen house prices rise and probably a little faster than we'd all be comfortable. <coughs> and if we take a step back and say, why is that? I do believe it's been a combination of um, lack of supply of land and actually lack of investment. I mean, there were a lot of property developers that were badly hurt as a result of the you know, 2008 crash. So it was natural that there would be a void in the market. I mean, what is what is true, and the Reserve Bank Governor said, I mean, that the, these very low interest rates actually, for all the arguments about housing affordability, actually are allowing a lot of people to get into the housing market because they can afford to pay their mortgage um, and they have had capacity to get into the housing market. So I think, given he's signalling that interest rates are likely to be low for quite a long period of time, the government does need to look at all the levers around housing to make sure that there's a, enough supply to ensure that there isn't Know, a runaway housing market because one thing I do know is that um, if you have a bubble in your housing market, long term that's really bad for your economy. That is one of the major issues that, that had a massive impact on the US economy. So you're you saying you, you, you will use those, you, you make sure those prudential tools are used if we get into a bubble like scenario? Well, what I'd say is that the, the, he's got to go through that process and that's, that's what he's doing. He's going through a, a discussion document, I think, about those at the moment. And look, at, as a kind of banker, I could, you know, I could take a step back and tell you, look, there might be ways to get around those rules. So I don't think we've absolutely, or anyone's absolutely buttoned down that, that they will work. Because we've seen these types of controls before, and there are always ways of getting around them. But what I do really share the governor's view on is that he is trying to protect the health of the banking system in New Zealand. And that is absolutely critical. The one thing that's got New Zealand, Australia, and Canada through the global financial crisis more than anything else has ultimately been that our banking system wasn't as badly affected as those other countries. So I think the governor is actually doing his job, standing up saying, look, I might just need more tools and be able to make sure that the quality of the banking system remains intact and it has integrity. So are you a bit worried that, that some of the reasons that the banks could try and get around it, like they did with the mortgage wars, say, back in 2003 or whatever, where they basically ignore what the Reserve Bank is trying to do, might try and circumvent these potential tools? Well, it's always possible, isn't it? I mean, I, I'm... I don't spend my day trying to work out how to do that, but I'm just saying that if you limit loan-to-value ratios, then by definition, you could, you know, the quaint notion is that people will save the balance, but it might be that they look to another financial institution or start borrowing from their lawyer or some other mechanism for doing that. 
that's what he needs to, I think, test out when he goes through this consultation process of how likely is it that they'll actually work and what will it mean for credit, for instance, in the SME sector that relies on borrowing against their home, for instance. There's a number of factors he needs to test out. But personally, he has my support that at least he's looking at those issues because, as I said, I think you know, it, you know, it's critical for the functioning of a, of a strong country that your banking system has integrity. So would you be comfortable if the Reserve Bank said let's limit loan to value ratios at nine percent, which a lot of first home buyers are finding? Um, if, if in the end, as a result of his analysis, and uh, he believed it was the right thing, I think the government will look very, very closely at it. Are we going to see anything come out in terms of documentation that shows material differences in agreement between, between Solid Energy and the government? Because all we've really seen so far is that the government wanted more different. Uh, I don't think that is right as, a, as an analysis. I think what you've seen is there was quite a lot of, uh, uh, well, there's a significant difference uh, in the, the, as much the, well, I think you can say the significant difference in the direction of the company uh, wanted to take solar energy and the government's belief in that. I mean, in the end, as you saw from the documents really released on Friday, they ultimately wanted to have a $27 billion investment in a natural resources company and the government's view was that that, that didn't work for us. So I, I don't think you can say we're in agreement on all things along the way. There was there was agreement in some areas, but not in others. But, but will we see further disagreement? Because I mean, Tom Powell praised the vision and said, not quite as far as you want to go, still going to lignite. Well, there's nothing new in terms of the lignite and you know biofuels and the other areas that they went into. That started well before national. Started right back in 2003. Um, and so there's a range of views there about the merits. Some people like some bits of it more than others. Um, there is quite a substantial difference between that, though, and, and a natural resources company that's capitalised the order of 27 billion. And, and why can't we have an independent inquiry? It seems like this. I'm not sure what would achieve a lot, really. I mean, what. <coughs> I think we have a pretty clear view of what's gone on at Solid Energy and why. I mean, I think part of what Don Elder says is actually right. I mean, the company has suffered from um, significant deterioration in coal prices. It's also suffered from some investments that just simply just didn't work out. Um, and as a result of that, it's, it's now in, in the position it's in where the government's having to work with the bankers to try and find a way through for Solid Energy. Um, I don't think there's anything magical there. I mean, in the end, they had a pretty significant build-up in their overhead structure. Um, that's well documented. They made some investments that didn't work out in non-core assets. That's very well documented. They made some asset investments in core assets, like Spring Creek, that didn't work out. Well, that's pretty well documented. And the coal price collapsed. That's well documented. And there's nothing magical at Solid Energy, just lots of things went wrong all at the same time. It seems like, like a pretty high-risk strategy, no currency, aging, only short-term Well, all of those things in the end are operational matters, and that's been the point I've been making. I mean, you can run around in circles trying to point fingers, but if National's to blame, uh, then so is Labor. Sorry, but in the end, the, 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 the issues of investments and the direction of the company are actually set by the management and board. It's the management and the board that are responsible for the structure of the balance sheet. It's the management and the board that are responsible for the investment decisions that are made. And in the end, they made those operational decisions. Now, you know, it would be some of the arguments I've seen in the last couple of days are ridiculous. They're the arguments based on the fact that if a public company went broke, it's the shareholders that are responsible. Well, I just don't see it that way. So in 2011, that scoping report uh, that threw up some problems. Yeah. So that was when you also went into the agency and they say they're going to um, sell solid energy amongst those other. No, um, and I think the, the, the reason for that is that there was, I guess, the hope that, well, firstly, there was quite a bit of debate between the company and the government about uh, the, essentially the merits of the scope of the study. It's fair to say that the government put a lot of credence in that report and the company didn't so much. Secondly, um, some of it was subjective, so it was, you know, the company had a very different price path 
um, and had low levels of proven disease, but was working on those the second issue and disagreed with that one on the first. So I mean, I guess um, my view would be that um, it was always, as soon as we got that scope and study, I think we were always of the view it would mean that solar energy certainly would be at the front of the queue in terms of um, being part of the next ownership program. But there was always a hope that they would be able to get there and resolve some of their issues and call, a focus on their core assets. I don't think so really. I mean, firstly, by then anyway, we'd already said five to seven billion. So, I mean, you've got to remember the sequence of events were that we gave the speech in the early part of 2011 saying this was our program, and these were the likely candidates that were involved, and this is the likely amount of money that would be released. Um, we then commissioned the scoping studies on all of the four SOEs, and it was only by the time we got that, that back that we realised, well, there's some issues there. The, the, it's, it's still, um, very unclear about whether we'll get five to seven billion. Even the solar energy was never part of the program. We may easily achieve that, we may not. Which now after we've um, gone through the, the best SOEs. What month did you receive the solar energy stuff? I don't know. It's my office. Is it earlier? Sorry. Earlier, 2011, rather. I don't. I can't remember the time. I think it's more the latter part of the year, but I might be wrong. Just to check. And were you able to release that? Sorry. Uh, I don't know. We need to check the. Um, we're able to do that, I suppose, and, and the commercial sensitivities might be in there, but um, I mentioned some part of that report that had come out, I and mean, it, it, was, it was certainly highly critical, that's the way I would describe it. What will you lose by holding that SOE committee quite? I mean, what's, the, what's the cost here? I mean, it's certainly quite a cost of process. Well, I guess the other, other side of the way of looking at it is what we're going to gain. Well, this is a major corporate collapse of, a, of, a, of an SOE, public accountability. Well, this, there is public accountability. I don't think you should get there just because you have a select committee inquiry. Would the government have to uh, cut spending um, to uh, offset the effects of the drought and still get to its surplus target? Um, again, too early to tell what the implications will be. I mean, you've seen the Minister of Finance saying that it's in the order of one to two billion dollars, uh, the early estimates. I think what's fair to say is that they're quite subjective at the moment. So there's been some talk out of Treasury that it could have cost about 0.7% of GDP, which is about one, one to one and a half billion dollars. <coughs> but everyone will admit that, that it depends on how much it rains, it depends how many, um, how many farmers have, have managed to keep um, their herds still milking. It depends on quite a number of factors. So the, the other thing is that the important point I reckon to remember is that if you put the, the enormous cost um, to one side that, that's, that's had the impact on, on farmers, um, you've got to look and say, okay, if, if, if the economy loses a billion dollars, let's say, how much does that reduce our tax revenue? And then how much of that might be offset by increased revenue in other areas? For instance, we know that other parts of the economy have been producing more tax revenue than we thought. So net on net, whether it actually has an impact on our capacity to get back to surplus is very unknown at this point, but not at all clear that it necessarily will. Will you know before the budget? Don't know. Well, I guess they'll, they'll, they'll obviously have to have the most up-to-date numbers when they go into the budget, but whether they'll be able to assess fully the impact of the drought by then, I don't know. There'll certainly be an estimate of them. So you're not going into the budget process thinking we have to find some savings here? No, not at the moment. Is the government any closer to a target on uh, emissions for 2020? Uh, no, we haven't. I mean, the Minister's been away overseas, as you probably will use traffic extensively on the WTO bit at the moment. Um, but he often, he'll come back in the fullness of time, we'll, we'll make sure that we set that target. How was that new Too early to tell, I think. He's, you know, he's up against good candidates. We raised the issue everywhere we went, but there's obviously quite a number of Latin American candidates, and I think there's seven in total, of that sort of number. So it's, it's always going to be a long shot, um, simply because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very political process. Um, you know, there's lots of particular candidates there. But, but as I say, to all the leaders, and anyone else that will listen. If you want my view, Tim Grocer has um, the best skills and the best capability, can bring the best capability to the job, and I hope he's successful. So can they discuss road pay and uh, were any decisions made about where through from here? Yes, it discussed Nova pay, and I think Minister Joyce will be in a position to give you a much fuller update on what happens next uh, this week. But any decisions about whether to keep the scheme at all? Uh, well, 
rather than for me to sort of wander down that path today, uh, maybe I'll just leave it to him because he's going to be in a position to talk about the technical review and other things with you to say this week. Can I just ask you about the budget you're talking about? Yes. Um, are you able to say what the things are for Prince's Margaret Hospital? Because it looks like they've got cross-eyed in the new case. No, I think Mike does tell you about that, I think. Okay. See you later.